began a study of the epistles uh, to the Colossians, a book that says over and over again that Jesus really is our all in all. And I hope as you, as you study this with me that you will become more persuaded than maybe you ever have been before that, that Christ truly is our complete and total sufficiency. I was reading through the book of Acts earlier this week, and the 20th chapter of Acts is where you see this young man that fell asleep while Paul was preaching, fell out of a window, he was killed, his name was Eutychus, and I've always felt bad for that young man. I mean, let's face it, millions of people have fallen asleep during preaching, and he just happened to fall in the wrong direction, and he got a lot of attention for it. But why is it that people fall asleep so much at church? Maybe it's bad preaching. Bad preaching can certainly be sleep-inducing. I have personally watched a lot of people fall asleep while I've preached in my life. There are different ways that people fall asleep in church. You, you can watch people as they're about to go, and you know it's about to happen. I mean, I've seen people who do the whole lean over thing, and uh, you know they, they kind of hope that you're not noticing it. I've seen people drool on their Bibles. My favorite is the guy who closes his eyes pretending that he's in contemplative thought, nodding while I'm preaching. I know he's asleep. Some people sleep, though, and they never close their eyes. Some people listen on autopilot. Their eyes are wide open. They're looking straight ahead, but they might as well be in a different city. But then there are those times where you're preaching and you're looking at somebody's face and they're looking back at you. And you can tell they just got it by the way their their face lights up or their eyes sparkle and and you can tell maybe for the very first time they're really hearing and there is for me personally no greater thrill in ministry than a moment like that and i don't think that there's anything that brought the apostle paul more joy than realizing that the gospel was getting heard so open your Bibles to the first chapter of Colossians. The theme of hearing the gospel is really what the first paragraph in Colossians is all about. Colossians 1, we're going to pick up in verse 3. Paul writes these words. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to really hear the gospel and, and how you can tell if people are just listening on autopilot or really understanding the gospel. But before I get into that, I want to make a side Point. And the side point is this, because I want you to notice this, and we see this in all of Paul's letters. Saints are edified when they hear that others are praying for them. You ever noticed in so many of Paul's letters, the very first thing that he does is essentially he says, I want you to know how much I pray for you. So he starts out this letter by saying, we always thank God when we pray for you. He begins by thanking God for what God is doing in the lives of the Christians in Colossae. I think sometimes when we study Paul's writings, we, we view him as this, as this theologian off somewhere in a library writing doctrinal uh, treatises. That is not what the letter of Colossians is. Colossians is a letter from a missionary in prison to real people that he really loves. And when you really love people... You really pray for them. So all through this book, Paul is going to remind them of that. He's going to say in verse 9 of chapter 1, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. 
He goes on in chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know about how much I am struggling for you. Now remember, if Paul is in Rome and he's in prison, then how is he struggling for people 500 miles away? Well, he is struggling in prayer. In fact, struggle is one of Paul's favorite words for prayer. Look how he uses it later in Colossians in chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. That word wrestle is the word we get the word agonize from. So what Paul does, all through this letter is say, I want you to know that there are some brothers over in the city of Rome who are agonizing in prayer for you every single day. Paul knew that if you tell people that, it's going to build them up. Now, let me ask you, when was the last time that you actually said to somebody, I am consistently and I am regularly praying for you? I am thanking God for you every single day. And I just, I just need you to know that. I just don't believe we understand how important the ministry of intercession is. Sometimes when we tell people we're praying for them, it's just a way that we end the conversation. We tell people we'll pray for them like, like some people say, see you later. It just means it's time for us to, to stop talking and move on. And that is not how Paul spoke about this issue. Paul said, I have got a church full of brand new baby Christians. And the best thing that I can do for them is pray earnestly for them every single day. You look at our prayer list. We pray for the sick, and that is very good. We pray for the bereaved. That is important. But when was the last time we had a list of names of people that were new Christians? And we just... We just needed their names listed so we could pray for them. Who is going to stand in the gap for these new Christians daily so that they won't get picked off by Satan? That is how Paul writes in all of his letters. It's one thing to have someone say almost flippantly, you know, I'll I'll pray for you. And it's another thing to have somebody look you in the eye and say, I'm going to wrestle for you in prayer every day. You see, these new Christians have been hearing some new talk. They they were told, you know, Epaphras, he didn't give you all of the truth. You need more. He's got you started, but but there's a whole lot more you need to know if you're going to really mature in your spirituality. So Paul wanted them to know they, they have everything that they need in Christ, but he also wanted them to know that there are people that are praying for them regularly. Look at look at what he says again in verse six. You heard it. And understood God's grace in all its truth. There is nothing that they are lacking. There is nothing more they need to hear than what they have already actually heard. They heard the gospel of grace in all its truth. Now he's going to say three things about this gospel of grace that you really need to understand. So write these down. Here's the first one. Number one, the gospel of grace is all you need. The good news of God's gracious offer of salvation through faith in Christ, Paul says, that is the truth. That's the whole truth. That's nothing but the truth. And from the very beginning, the saints in Colossae heard that God could not be obligated. They heard that salvation was God's initiative and that the atoning work of Christ was completely sufficient for the sins of the whole world. Because listen, they have never heard a message like that before. You can't go to any other religion in the world and hear a message like the gospel of grace because every single other religion in the world says, here is the more that you need to do to make yourself right with God. I think we sometimes forget how unique the Christian faith is. They were having a conference one time in England. A bunch of scholars were debating the uniqueness of Christianity. They couldn't come up with anything. They say that C.S. Lewis, the famous Christian author, came late to the meeting. And in typical British expression, he said, what's the rumpus about? They said, well, we're trying to decide what the uniqueness of Christianity is. He said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And he's right. He's right. 
The problem is one of the most common traits of fallen man is what I call the adding reflex. You, you ever notice that? We want to add to everything. A lady's given a perfectly good recipe to make a chocolate cake. But she wants to add to it a little bit, to tweak it, make it a little better. It's part of our Adamic nature to want to add to anything. So, so this message comes along, and it is not like any other message in the entire world. This message that God in Christ has completely accomplished your salvation, and you cannot add anything to it. But there is something about us that says, you know, it's not going to stop me from trying. Paul insists that the gospel is Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. That means there is nothing lacking in the gospel that needs to be supplemented by human reason or human effort. You cannot find a fuller revelation of God than you have in Jesus Christ. Maybe this illustration will help. Do you remember the television show Happy Days? Raise your hand if you do. You're old. (laughs) Happy Days introduced America to one of the most popular characters in television history, a man called the Fonz. Do you remember the Fonz? Every time Happy Days would start, it would introduce the Fonz, and he would make his entrance, and he had on his jeans and a motorcycle jacket and a white t-shirt, and he would pull out a comb, and he would comb his hair and say, hey. The point was, the Fonz was unimprovable. He was as good as it gets. You you cannot improve upon the Fonz to make him better. And Paul is saying the exact same thing about the gospel of grace. It's unimprovable. The people that hear the gospel can completely trust in it. John Selden was the leading historian and legal authority in England in the 17th century. He had a library of 8,000 volumes. Now that might not sound like much to you, but listen, in the 1600s to have a library of 8,000 volumes, that was a huge deal. It was unheard of. On his deathbed, he said this, I have surveyed most of the learning that is among the sons of men, And my study is filled with books and manuscripts on various subjects. But at present, I cannot recollect any passage out of all my books whereon I can rest my soul. Save this from the sacred scriptures. And he quoted Titus 2.11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And I love that verse because not only does it say that the grace of God has appeared, but it says that it has appeared to all men. And that is the second thing that Paul reminds those who are in Colossae, that the gospel of grace is for all the world. Look again at verse 6, how it's rendered. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. In other words, every creature in every culture is hearing exactly the same message that you are hearing. Paul wants them to know they're not missing out on anything. These guys came into Colossae and they they try to convince these new Christians in the church that Epaphras wasn't giving them the whole story. Paul says, no, you're hearing the same thing that they heard in Jerusalem. And they are hearing the same thing that you heard in Rome or in Crete or in Europe or in Asia. Wherever men have gone to preach about Jesus, they have declared the same gospel that you are hearing in Colossae. Look what he says in chapter one, verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant The good news is that the the gospel is not native to any particular place or any particular culture. And do you realize how bold, how scandalous actually this is? He is contending that the gospel of Christ is absolute truth. Therefore, it is universal truth for the entire world. And that smacks right in the face of 
of our current postmodern philosophy that says, you know, you've got your truth and I've got my truth. And if your truth works for you, that's wonderful. But don't take your truth somewhere else and try to tell them that their truth is not right. See, our postmodern world says there is no such thing as a universal truth. Every culture has got to find out what is true for them. And Paul would say, that's not what I believe. The gospel is true for me, and the gospel is true for everybody. The gospel is the truth. And if you are listening to any other philosophy, any other religious tradition, any other ideology that that does not line up with the gospel, then what you are believing is not the truth. All the truth is in the gospel. Now that is not what the world is always hearing. Maybe it's because in our attempt to be politically correct today and to live peaceably in a postmodern culture, we have become a little less insistent that we hold the truth that the whole world needs to hear. Paul would later say in the first chapter of Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. If you were going to give a gift, just one gift, and give it to the whole world, what could you give that would be appropriate? I mean, think about that. What is something that, that you could give to everyone in the whole world that would be appropriate for everybody? You couldn't give a computer to everybody. Most of the world can't even read. You can't give a car to everybody. Many places in the world don't have roads. You couldn't give a coat to people that don't wear coats or sandals to people that don't wear sandals. You couldn't give food because a lot of the food that you eat in a lot of parts of the world, they couldn't grow and their stomachs could never ingest it. What could you give to every single person that is alive today that would be appropriate and something that they could use right now? You can give them the gospel. The word of God is the only seed I know that you can plant anywhere in the world and it will bear fruit. The gospel is personal enough to belong to you and it is universal enough to belong to the entire world And when it does belong to you, you will have a burden for the whole world. When you really have heard the gospel and it's dawned on you that you have now possessed the the truth that is true for everyone in the entire world that's living at this moment, then you start to care about the world. And if you don't care about the world, then you don't really know the gospel. They asked one time for an artist to paint a picture of a dying church. He did, but... It wasn't quite what they expected. It wasn't a a little run-down, dilapidated church building out there in the country somewhere. He painted a beautiful, stately edifice with plush carpets and beautiful stained glass windows. And at the door, there was a little box. And over the box, there was a sign that said, Missions. And over the slot that goes into the box, there were cobwebs. Phillips Brooks was asked one time, what would you do to turn around a dying church? And he said, the very first thing that I would do on the very first Sunday is I would take up a special offering for missions. Look again at verse six with me from the Living Bible. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world and changing lives everywhere just as it changed yours that very first day you heard it and understood about God's great kindness to sinners. And that leads to the third thing that you need to know when you've heard the gospel of grace. Not only is the gospel of grace all that you need, not only is the gospel of grace for everyone, but also the gospel of grace affects all of life. Because God's word is alive. And it's going to bear fruit in the lives of the people who have truly heard it. What's the evidence? Paul says, now I have heard that you have heard the gospel. Well, what's the evidence? 
How does Paul know they've really heard the gospel? Paul says, the reason that I know that you've heard the gospel is Epaphras has told me how much your lives have actually changed. Look at verses 4 and 5 in Colossians 1 again. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. You know the gospel is heard when there is faith, hope, and love. And it's growing in great abundance. He heard about their faith in Christ. They were, they were growing in the gospel because they were not putting their trust in the works of men. They were not putting their trust in the wisdom of men. They were putting their trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross to forgive them of their sins. That's how Paul knew they had heard the gospel. He knew they had heard the gospel because they were loving all the saints. The Jews were loving the Gentiles. The Gentiles were loving the Jews. And the slaves were loving the free and the free were loving the slaves and the men and the women were getting along and the Scythian and the barbarian were getting along and all these barriers that they had in their, in their culture were just torn down. He had heard at their church those walls had come down and the people were actually getting along and loving each other. He knew that they had heard the gospel because of their hope. They had set their sights on another world and another place when the people in Colossae died. They did not grieve like people who have no hope. They had not set their hearts or their affections on material things. They had put their treasure up in heaven. I told you before about Lee Strobel. He's probably the best known apologist for the gospel in America today, but, but he was an agnostic for most of his life. His wife came to Christ two years earlier and he started searching and checking out Christ. And eventually he became a Christian. And I guess the day he realized that his walk with Christ was very sincere was the day that his five-year-old daughter said to her mother, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. You see, I think that one reason people want to, to add more to the gospel is because they are not convinced the gospel alone is sufficient enough to produce life transformation. I don't believe at the heart that people who are legalists are, are bad people. I just don't believe they trust the gospel enough. I believe in their heart they believe that people are not going to become strong moral and spiritual people by simply trusting the spirit of God to do a work in them as they follow Jesus. So they decide to, to help that process along a little. And that really is the bottom line. Is the truly spiritual life the result of human reason or human effort? Or is it the result of God's gracious indwelling spirit? Look at verse 8 in Colossians 1 from the message. He's the one who told us how thoroughly love had been worked into your lives by the Spirit. Paul insisted that the Spirit of Jesus Christ was sufficient to produce a community of people living lives that would be noticed and would be talked about. And let me tell you, that is one of the ways that the world hears the gospel. The world hears the gospel by watching your life. There's a well-known story of a debate, at least a proposed debate, between Charles Bradlaugh, a devout atheist, and H.P. Hughes. H.P. Hughes was a minister in London that had a rescue mission in their slums. Bradlaugh was a famous atheist in his day, and he challenged Hughes to a debate, and Hughes accepted the debate, but he said, I will come, but on these terms. When I come, I'm going to bring a hundred people from my mission. And you have to give them permission to give their testimony about how faith in Christ has radically changed their life. And I don't care if you cross-examine them. They can handle questions. Bradlaw agreed. And Hughes said, and I'll tell you what else. You can bring 100 people who can stand up and say how turning their backs on God has made them better and happier and more peaceful and improve their families. So the, debate, the day of the debate came, 
the auditorium packed with, with thousands of people, and Bradlaw never showed up. So Hughes stood up and he had his people one by one stand up and give their testimony to that crowd of thousands. And that night, many people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. By the way, that's the last point. Paul was saying that the reason that he can thank God, the reason that God is glorified, is that God is always glorified when his word is really heard. When God's word is really heard, there is going to be life change. And it's going to cause men all over the world to fall down on their knees and thank God. Let me ask you, is that happening all over the world? No. You might wonder how that can happen all over the world. There are many places in the world where people haven't even heard about Jesus. And if people haven't heard about Jesus, then how could God be glorified? That's a really good question. But let me tell you something else. God is not glorified in many places where the word has been heard and the word has been preached. Could it be that there are churches all over America full of people that still have not heard the gospel? I believe that's true. If I showed you some of the letters and emails that I've been written in my time, you would know that's true. When you see people that still want to put their trust in their own ability, in their, their own morality, or they want to correct their own doctrine so that they are in such a state that they are making themselves right with God, then you realize there are a lot of people that still have not actually heard the gospel. When you see people who don't love a man because he's black or don't love a woman because she has an accent or they don't want people of a certain socioeconomic level to go to their church, when you see people who don't love their brothers or sisters because they, they don't have the same opinion on different topics that they share, then you know there are people that still have not actually heard the gospel. When you see folks absolutely devastated by death or tragic circumstances and you see the worry and, and their anxiety, it's the exact same level of a person who is an absolute pagan then you know there are still a lot of people who have not heard the gospel. I want to tell you America is full of religion, but it is not too full of the gospel. Religion does not glorify God, but the gospel does. I'm reminded of what Jesus said. There will always be people that are ever hearing, but never understanding. I heard a story back in the day when the telegraph was the main way that people communicated long distance. The company was looking for a telegraph auto, auto operator, and they put an ad in the newspaper. This young man saw the ad, and he went to apply. He walked into where people were to wait to be interviewed, and there were eight or nine folks sitting there in this office area waiting, and there was this door that was closed, a glass door, and behind it you could hear the sound of a telegraph machine. So he sat down to wait his turn to be interviewed along with the other people. And after a couple of minutes, he, he gets up, he walks through that door and he closes it behind him. And everybody out in the office reception room just kind of thought that was strange. A couple of minutes later, the man who was the boss came out with his arm around the young man. And he said, y'all can go home now. I've given this young man the job. The people in the reception area said, that isn't fair. We were here before him. You haven't even interviewed us yet. And the boss replied, the whole time that you've been here on the other side of this wall, the machine has simply been saying, if you can understand this, come in and take the job. I read that story and I thought, how like the American church. We've learned to listen in autopilot. The noise comes in one ear and it goes out the other. We get up and we walk out to our cars and we go live our week like we didn't even hear a thing. And we come back and we sit down and we listen some more. Now, I admitted at the very start of this sermon that one reason people fall asleep in church is because of bad preaching. I will tell you a second. It is because of bad listening. I am asking you this morning, have you really heard the gospel? Because if you have, 
somebody else has got to have heard it by now.